Hello, everyone. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Christine Muir. I am the community librarian at Cary Library. I am so happy to be partnering with the Lexington Field and Garden Club to offer this program today. I am recording this event and I will share the link with all of you once I post it to the library's YouTube channel early next week. I will also share a copy of the slides that you'll see today. So if you feel like you're getting a lot of information, you can sit back and relax because you'll get a copy of all the um, printed materials when I send out the video link. We will have time for questions and answers after the formal presentation. You can enter your questions into the chat and I will read them uh, at the end of the program to Lee. If you would like to come on camera and ask your own question, you may unmute yourself and then wait for me to call on you to ask your question so that if multiple people wanna ask, we're not talking over each other. Uh, we will also be using a couple of polls today. And if you haven't done that before, it's pretty straightforward. But if you have any questions, just use the chat to ask me and I'll be monitoring that throughout uh, today's program. So with that, I will turn things over to Marilyn Wingo Ringowitz, who is the president <laughs> of the Lexington Field. No, no, Garden vice Club. president. Vice, vice president. president. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, uh, I am uh, Marilyn Ringowitz. I'm vice president of the Lexington Field and Garden Club and also the uh, programs chair. Um, today's talk on the Quabbin Reservoir, a multi-town land and water conservation project, is being presented by Lee Youngblood, longtime director of Mount Grace Land Conservation Trust, and now a senior advisor. Um, the Conservation Trust is a nonprofit incorporated in 1986 and it is based out of Athol, Massachusetts. The trust's mission is the conservation of woodland and agricultural land in North Central and Western Mass. Um, when just, this is an aside, when um, introducing myself to Lee um, and after talking for a while, I mentioned I was from Barry, which is a town that borders the Quabbin Reservoir area. And I also told her that I spent time on my uncle and aunt's and grandmother's farms, which were in Peter Salmon Athol. And uh, that my uncle's farm was used as a summer camp. And come to find out it is now the farm school. And she was involved with my aunt and my cousins and in um, forming this wonderful school, which was established in 1989. The Quabbin Reservoir area is a great place to hike and bird watch if you haven't been there. And a friend of mine told me the other day that being at the Quabbin is like being at a national park and it really is. So let me present to you, Lee Youngblood. Thank you. So thank you very much, Marilyn. I, I appreciate that. I wanna, um, I wanna thank you and also Phyllis Damon Comins, Ashley Rooney, and of course, Christine Muir and everyone from the library, the Cary Library and the Lexington Field and Garden Club for inviting me. I'm going to uh, share my screen and start my slideshow. And if that uh, looks right, I'll get started. So um, I also want to recognize Lenny Johnson. Mount Grace has a board member, a longtime board member who lives near, near to you in Carlisle. Here's the Quabbin Reservoir. It's the largest body of water in Massachusetts. And it's the primary drinking water supply for two and a half million people in greater Boston, including Lexington. And so that's nearly half of the people in Massachusetts get their water from the Quabbin Reservoir. And the Quabbin is only one of five unfiltered major metropolitan uh, water supplies in the entire US. 
Um, my, my talk today is going to connect three things. Uh, the destruction of four Massachusetts towns, the construction of the dam and the impoundment of the Swift River, the, the actually three branches of the Swift River, and also land conservation in the greater watershed. So I'm gonna connect those three things. Uh, this, at this time, I wanna also acknowledge the Nipmuc, Sokoki, Abenaki, Narragansett, and Wampanoag and other tribal nations, people who are still with us today, but who were largely displaced from this very same place. So these are the watershed lands and infrastructure along the journey that rainwater takes from the Quabbin uh, to you. So I understand you can see my cursor. And so Lexington is shown here as is where I am right now in Athol at Skyfields Arboretum, which is Mount Graceland Conservation Trust headquarters. And you see the watershed lands that are outlined and two reservoirs that are currently used for Boston's drinking water supply. I wanna mention a phrase that I'm gonna be using, which is uh, the North Quabbin region. So we have the Quabbin watershed lands and then there's some more area of Massachusetts up to the New Hampshire and Vermont border that is referred to as the North Quabbin region. And I'm gonna uh, be saying that more and more. And you can see that, for example, uh, Maryland's aunt's farm is in on the Athol Orange border, not exactly in the watershed lands, but it's really in what we consider the same neighborhood, which is the North Quabbin neighborhood. So over here, not that far away in Boston, um, our state capital was uh, settled in 1630. So that's um, you know nearly 400 years ago. And by 1650, there was the first waterworks company was incorporated. And there was been a series of, of reservoirs that were built further and further west over time. And until today, we have these two active reservoirs. So for such a large place, uh, the Quabbin Reservoir is easy for us to take for granted, uh, but it's more, I'm here to say that it's more than just a matter of quantity and quality of water. Uh, the Quabbin, as you can see in the photo, is a vast wilderness, and it's only an hour or so from the Cary Library. Google Maps tells me it's an hour and 15 minutes from the Cary Library. But it's also a broad and colorful pool of cultural significance. And it has many facets, including a long pre-colonial history, the decommissioned towns we're gonna to talk more about, recent controversies about hunting and endangered species restoration, and there are perennial pushes and pulls about more public recreation. These are among the many, many cultural issues that you can explore uh, related to the Quabbin. My goal today is to share a few facts but I wanna share more about the people that I've encountered in 35 years of living, working, commuting and conserving land all around the Quabbin. So as Marilyn mentioned, um, this is a picture of her aunt Alice. And in, in 2000, uh, I started working at Mount Grace in 1994. So in 2000, it was still felt like early days. This is a famous a postcard because uh, her, her grandmother's farm was called the Sentinel Elm Farm. You can see this beautiful tree and it's at the top of a hill. And I had the opportunity to work with Alice to conserve her farm and then sell it, convey it to the farm school. And it's, it's possible that students from Lexington have gone there to, for camp. And the farm school has grown. So this was the first project. I think this was the second one, the third one, and the fourth one. And altogether, it now protects about 500 acres, 450 acres, which is a very considerable farm. So it's an important element of the ongoing rural life of the Quabbin area. So while the Quabbin in Eastern Mass, I'm sure that the Quabbin can seem like a far off place removed from day-to-day -day life, um, I'm hoping that this will inspire you to think about ways that suburban and urban Eastern Mass are connected to rural Western Mass. And this is another example. 
Uh, Bill Foy, he was the very first landowner that I worked with at Mount Grace in 1994. He was born and raised right here in Athol where our headquarters is. And he lived in Lexington during his career as a professor of chemistry. He was an author, an avid fly fisherman and an early conservationist, which I'm gonna tell you more about. <clears throat> so um, I mentioned here that I was, while I was a student at UMass, I, was, I went to UMass hoping to work for a land trust when I got finished. But instead, I was hired by the founder of Mount Grace, Keith Ross, in my second semester. And this is important because for three years, uh, starting in 1994, I worked part-time at Mount Grace while I went to school part-time. And I want to tell you that landowners like Bill Foy taught me as much about land conservation as I learned in school. Although I learned, uh, a lot of great things at UMass and I want as a short aside to tell you that uh, a year ago, the University of Massachusetts received a prestigious award for its leadership in conservation and um, you can Google Alpine Award UMass to learn more about that. And uh, I have a little cameo in that 10 minute video. But back to Bill Foy, in, in the midst of his many accomplishments, uh, he was a conservationist and he spent a lot of time outdoors. And before I talk more about him, I'm just curious um, how many of you might have known Bill or Lila Foy, because I know he lived in Lexington, Lexington for decades. So we're gonna do a little poll and Christine's gonna help with that. I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to see the poll. So if you could, oh, there it is, I do see it. So if you could select all of these that uh, are true for you, because I wanna know what is your personal connection to the Quabbin? Perhaps there's someone else that you know from this region. So I'll give you a minute to answer this. Christine, I can't see the answers. I will share the results when they come out, but we've gotten almost half of the people attending have uh, selected, I don't want to say voted, <laughs> but they, they have already um, put in some answers. We have about 20 seconds left. And right now the two uh, most common answers are uh, drink water from the Quabbin and plan to visit sometime. So okay. in about five seconds, I will end the poll and share the results and then everybody should be able to see those. Okay. So then I'll talk about these two books that are showing there's Trout waters, so Bill Foy, he grew up in the 1920s or 30s uh, in Athol, and he was fishing with his father in the Swift River before the Quabbin was built. And so his book, Trout Waters, is a, a story and rem remembrances of those trout streams, many of which are now flooded. So it's, it's quite fascinating. And there is a copy now at the, at the Cary Library. And, and then he was inspired to write poetry um, and that's what North Quabbin Wilds is. And uh, we do have copies of that at Mount Grace. If anyone's interested, you can contact me to purchase copies of either of these books. So then, um, so thank you for answering the poll. Uh, let me just look at that. Um, I'm very excited to know that there were people that know Bill or Lila. And I'm glad to hear that people are going for recreation and even glad that more people, I hope that you're inspired to, um, to visit after this talk. So this, uh, I wanna read a very short excerpt from his book, Trout Waters. Um, just give me a minute. This is just to uh, whet your appetite, so to speak. The branches and feeder streams of Swift River in central Massachusetts have all the variety of rushing, roaring and whispering waters along with a marvelous wealth of forests and vegetation that encloses them. My father fished much of this water. Some now disappeared under the Quabbin Reservoir. I was a child before the valleys were flooded and I was exposed to their magical streams at an early age. Those lost waters were of exceptional beauty and I remember them quite clearly. So this is a picture of the Swift River. Uh, it's not land that Bill Foy owned, but um, 
it is conservation land that's protected that is actually available for sale if you want to own a piece of the Swift River that uh, you can contact me. So Bill personally conserved 500 acres in his lifetime and all 500 of the acres are still permanently, uh, excuse me, are still privately owned. So on this map, what's dark green were lands owned by Bill Foy. So he owned land on the east branch of the Swift River in Peter Sam, and he owned land on the west branch of the Swift River in New Salem. And then he owned land in the North Quabbin region on the Tully River. And he bought these pieces of land in the, in the 60s for himself before conservation was very popular. And the reason he bought it, he's probably living in Lexington at the time, he liked to come back out here to fish and he wanted to protect the habitat for, for trout. And so when I say that I learned a lot from Bill, um, I'm quite sincere in that. Bill passed away in 2014, but his, the land that he loved and conserved is still available in perpetuity to be enjoyed by, by everybody, including some of our volunteers, uh, one of whom wrote this field note that I'm not gonna read, but if you've had a chance to read through it, you can tell that many people are still enjoying these lands. And I just wanted to point out that the farm school that we talked about before is right nearby, right here, if I have that right. Okay. So private individuals who are interested in conservation um, work with land trusts and state agencies. And um, you might or might not know that in Massachusetts, we have 140 land trusts, more or less. About a half dozen are statewide or larger. A dozen are like Mount Grace, regional with a half dozen staff or more. And most land trusts in Massachusetts are either single town, uh, single staffed or all volunteer. Now we share a lot of information and there are land, excuse me, uh, land trust associations that help us um, provide us with professional information and resources and networking opportunities, including massland.org, the Wildlands and Woodlands Regional Conservation Partnership Network and the National Land Trust Alliance. And of course, we also work, landowners can also work with towns, state and federal agencies to conserve land. And I know that Lexington has its own land trust and has been um, very active. And I'm sure you share the sentiment that in Massachusetts, we're very fortunate to have a rich tradition of conservation. We have a population that values nature and we have several reliable sources of funding to continue the trend. So this is a little more about Mount Grace. It shows you our 23 town region in North Central Mass. Our service area covers 500,000 acres, which is a 10th of the area of Massachusetts. And I showed you our, um, where Athol is where our headquarters are. I wanna say just a little bit about um, land conservation, cause I'm gonna, you know, using that term, it means different things. And just as a, as a refresher, um, land can be conserved either by transferring the land or by keeping the land and conveying a permanent restriction or a permanent easement. And the reason it's important, another reason it's important to talk about this very briefly is because in Massachusetts, there's still a million more acres of priority acres yet to be protected. And so we all, um, you know, it's very helpful for everyone to be familiar with these the process of conservation so you can talk to your friends and neighbors about it. So you can transfer land or keep the land into an easement. You can do a sale or a donation or a combination, which is known as a bargain sale, where you might um, be paid a portion of the, of the value and you donate a portion. And sometimes it's a balance of balancing time and money. Um, usually the more you wanna be paid, the longer it takes to protect the land. That's not always true, but it, uh, it's generally true. And of course, all it's good to keep in mind that in somebody's or your own property, it's not important to protect the whole land. In fact, you could convey some land, put a CR on some land and keep some land out. And so there's flexibility there. And of course, land can be conserved now or later. This is a picture of the office where I'm sitting right now. This is Skyfields Arboretum and Mount Grace's uh, office, which was bequeathed to Mount Grace with 40 acres of land. And so our benefactor uh, conserved the land in her lifetime and then uh, with another organization and then donated to Mount Grace in her will. So 
So you can see Quabbin Reservoir here. It's in, it's really the anchor of Mount Grace's region. And it's really the heart of the conservation work we do. Um, the watershed is roughly in this area, but you can see the Quabbin is an important part of this accidental green belt that goes around the industrial towns of Athol and Orange. And this is quite a remarkable amount of contiguous protected land that's been compiled over a hundred years by um, there's some state forest land, there's federal flood projects after the hurricanes of 36 and 38, nonprofits like Mass Audubon and the trustees uh, have land here, there's municipal land and a lot of other conservation land that makes up this green belt. Uh, Mount Grace's region, uh, we can see, see there's still towns north of Athol and Orange, we're on the Vermont and New Hampshire border, and here's the Connecticut River for reference. Um, We've helped conserve 35,000 acres um, since 1986, and we do that one parcel at a time or through multi-landowner conservation projects, which I'll talk about later. This is the Miller's River that flows east and west, and it also parallels uh, Route 2. So you might know our region goes roughly from Gardner to Greenfield, and um, Route 2 is the uh, main corridor through our region. Now I want to share a short video with you. It's just 30 seconds. I'm very proud of all that we have accomplished over the last 30 years. Especially in these challenging times, with your support, we can continue to conserve thousands more acres of precious, irreplaceable land. As we all increasingly realize, once land is gone, it is gone forever. And once it is conserved, it is safe for us and for future generations. The choice is ours together. So that video, um, can you see my screen now? Yes. Sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so the, that video is an excerpt from a, an award-winning 14-minute uh, video that was made by Cambridge filmmaker um, Boyd Estes. It's called What the Land Is, and you can watch it at our website, mountgrace.org. I love this relief map because it shows you the attractiveness of the Swift River uh, to Boston. You can see um, the Swift River Valley here in between, uh, well, there's the Berkshires, the Connecticut River Valley, where it's flat, and then this is the central uh, mass called the Monadnock Uplands, and then the, the Merrimack Valley, where it's very flat, close to Boston. And so this valley within the uplands um, looked like a good place to impound water. The blue dot is Lexington. And this inset map shows you the four towns. This is Dana, Greenwich, Enfield, and Prescott. Um, the decommissioned towns, so this is the, where, how the towns looked before there was Quabbin. And they mostly um, are comprised of uh, Peter Sam in New Salem or this protected watershed land or the land under the water. Oh, I shouldn't go past this. So three branches of the Swift River flow into the Quabbin Reservoir. The east, the middle branch, and the west. And Bill Foy, in his book Trout Waters, writes about submerged streams in, in all three of the branches. And to create um, the, the reservoir, a dam was built here. Here's a photo during construction. And a dike, almost just as large, is built here. We'll get a closer look at those. So um, photographer uh, um, Les Campbell, he, he loved the Quabbin. And in fact, his, uh, he's now in his 90s. And his studio was located on Route 9, um, very close to the Quabbin Visitor Center. And I when I, uh, I've known this, this triptych forever. And I think it's a great summary of my talk. You know, there's the four towns that were 
decommissioned or destroyed. Uh, there's the clearing of the trees, which led to the, which was done before the dam was constructed and the, and the water filled in. So then we have construction of the uh, reservoir. And then this is a beautiful picture that um, to me indicates the protection of the watershed lands, the conservation of the watershed lands. This map is one of my um, favorite maps of the Quabbin because it's so useful. I've literally worn out several of these maps. So on this map, you can see there's several things I wanna bring to your attention. There's the Quabbin Park right here, which is on Route 9 that goes between Ware and Belchertown. And this is where the dam is, and this is where the dike is. And it also shows, and you can drive there, and there's actually, um, you can't drive across the dams anymore, but you can drive through the park. There's three entrances, and you can actually go up to the top of the hill and get quite a glorious view. Um, and it's interesting to note, uh, to get oriented right away, that it's, you don't usually see the whole Quabbin, right? If you're over here by, um, in the west by the dam, you see this part of the Quabbin. And if you're over here in the east, you see this part of the Quabbin. And so you have to really get up high to see the whole thing. Um, this map is also helpful for hiking because it shows if you had a, a copy in, a, in the resources that indicates how you can get this map. Um, it has all of the gates, the numbered gates that go all the way around the Quabbin. Where, and the, the, the gates are primarily at Old Town Roads where you can park and then walk in. And there's a lot of... Um, scenes and remnants of history, stone walls and roads that um, where tours are, are held to explore the four decommissioned towns. So let's take another poll. If you could help, I'm just wondering about um, how many of you have been to the Quabbin and how you go there. So have you, have you actually visited the Quabbin Reservoir yet? And let us know how. In, in, um, while we're waiting for people to reply, I'll just mention that uh, in the North Quabbin, there's really two or maybe three, only three good vantage points where you can, from, from close proximity to the road, where you can see, get a good view of the Quabbin. One is right on Route 202 over here. Um, one is uh, behind the fire station in New Salem where you actually have to walk, but it's worth the walk. And then one is on farther, I think that's, yeah, that's also one, uh, excuse me, 202 where you can get a view. And um, right now, because of COVID, you can't rent boats at the Quabbin, but usually you can. You can bring your own boat there. There's lots of rules, so you have to look for that. Um, and I'm expecting that most people will have just driven by and not seen it. So I'm curious to see the results. That was perfect timing, Lee. That was just exactly a minute. So I've ended the poll and I'm sharing the results now. Yes. Um, yeah, and we can't tell how many people have driven by and I, I should have, I'm curious about people who have only driven by. Um, but I'm, and of course, and I didn't want to have too many choices. So we didn't put none. But um, yeah, the overlooks are really worth uh, checking out and hiking is certainly recommended. So personally, you know, I mentioned that's really individual stories. Every There's so many individual stories about the Quabbin Reservoir. And this is a little bit about mine. Um, really, there, this talk is really an introduction to these topics because lots of people have done lots of research over the years. Um, and, uh, you know, you'll get different, there's so many different viewpoints that you can listen to and uh, to get a different view on the Quabbin. So I discovered the Quabbin when I uh, found myself suddenly a single parent living in Ware in an apartment with really no yard to speak of. And I could drive 15 minutes and be in this vast wilderness. And that was around 1986 when I moved there. And, uh, you know, unbeknownst to me, that was when Mount Grace was founded. And for about seven years, I worked in municipal conservation. And I, so I spent a lot of time outdoors with my family recreating at the Quabbin and my work was related to, concert, uh, to wetland co conservation. And so I encountered a lot of landowners who were developing land near wetlands because they didn't know about conservation options. And it really, so both my experiences um, enjoying the Quabbin and talking with landowners led to my interest of working for a land trust sometime in the future. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> 
<clears throat> I got a different perspective on the quabbin when I kind of foolishly uh, joined this round quabbin bike ride, which uh, went uh, 100 kilometers, which is 60 miles. It started in Ware. We went this way and then this way and up here and down and then down Route 32A. And I didn't come in last, but I was nearly last. <laughs> and um, but it did give me an appreciation of the quabbin. And I definitely, um, I don't know if I could say I recommend it, but I def definitely recommend visiting by car. So in those days when I was there, um, I'd take the kids to play. And this is during low water time. So this, is, this shows you how the water level at the Quabbin has fluctuated quite dramatically. And it was right here when I was living in Ware, when this is what the, the, the riprap along the edge of the water, we were at a very low, a very low water time. Um, and what I want to say about that is, um, we'll, we'll come back to it. So this, um, this craft was available in different forms at the Visit Quabbin Visitor Center. The Quabbin Visitor Center is also closed right now because of COVID, but they have wonderful resources there about the construction of the Quabbin, about the water level of the Quabbin, and um, it's just, you know, we about the wildlife of the Quabbin, and we spent a lot of time in that education center and learned um, as we visited ourselves, you know, keeping an eye on the level of the reservoir was something that everyone was interested in. And in fact, you can keep an eye on the Quabbin at this, at this website. And it's a webcam. This picture was taken earlier this week. It's refreshed every 20 seconds. And uh, yeah, you could just go to that website anytime. And those black marks are not on my screen. That must be on the camera. Um, so I want to show you this. This slide is about the level of the water. So this is the spillway over here on the top left. This is another view of the spillway. This is low water, kind of boring. Then when the quabbin is full, it gets much more exciting. And the water flows, this is the same overflow, flows over and then flows, here's the, here's the dam where it's flowing over and then flows down this river and then drops, goes through this, under, under this bridge and you can stand right on the bridge and watch this facet, you know, exciting spray. And this is the, it drops down and then it forms the new Swift River. So all three branches of the Swift River converge into the Quabbin and then emerge um, over the spillway as the Swift River. And it's a very popular cold water fishery because the water is coming out of, um, for the most part, out of the bottom of the Quabbin because up here in the top right, uh, I forget what this is called, but this is at the base of the dam. And this is actually water from the Quabbin bubbling up. And this is the real new headwaters of the Quabbin Reservoir. That's, I believe there's always water emerging from there. And then the water, when it goes over the spillway, joins together and creates the Swift River, which eventually joins the Chicopee River and then joins the Connecticut River. So that's exciting. Um, I wanna go back and just tell you a little bit about this, um, this chart. So in, in the 60s, there you know, got to be quite an emergency. There was no more land farther west to build another um, reservoir and they did think about diverting the Connecticut River. Um, but instead in the 80s, um, fortunately, you know, there were more precipitation. When it dropped again in the 80s, there was a very concerted effort to, to push conservation and also to make a lot of repairs. And just by doing those two things, conservation and repairs, the water level use has gone from uh, over 300 million gallons a day to 220 million gall gallons a day. And today there's considered to be surplus water at the Quabbin. So I just wanted to show you this map. This is how I've, in the last 35 years, uh, the red places are places that I've lived and these are places that I've worked. And so when I, in fact, when I started working at Mount Grace, I was living down here. So it was literally my daily commute to either drive around the Quabbin this way or drive back and forth around the Quabbin that way. And um, I just, 
it's something that if you live in the North Quabbin, people don't really think about the Southern part of the Quabbin, but it's a completely different experience. When you're in the South, you can see the expanse of water, visit the park and really get a sense of the vastness of the, of the, of the water body. When you're in the North where I live now in Warwick, it's, this is the watershed. So where I live and work now is the watershed of the Quabbin, which is really the forest. And it's hard to see the reservoir uh, through the trees. And so, but it still gives um, quite a lot of feeling to the fabric of our life, which I'll say a little bit more about. And just to give you a sense of how the forest and watershed lands blend into the uh, other rural areas in the North Quabbin, um, where I live in Warwick, the population is less than 800. Um, this New Salem town, the population is about 1,000. And over here in Lexington, the population is 34,000. And so just about four times the Lexington population uh, is equivalent to the 23 towns where Mount Grace works. And before we uh, move into the four towns, um, I wanted to mention that my, origin my talk was originally scheduled for March 15th. And we all know what was happening in the, the middle of March, everything was canceled. But on the very same day in Peter Sam, um, Nipmuc author Larry Spotted Crow Man was scheduled to give a talk about uh, exploring relationships between land people and, and nature through the eyes of Native Americans. So I think it's really important to remember that um, these displaced people are actually still with us. And in fact, last fall, um, you can see this land sale in 2019, I had the honor of attending a ceremony marking the second transfer of land back to the Nitmuk people. And in this instance, it's 18 acres in the town of Peter Sam, uh, transferred by uh, landowner, historian, outdoor educator, Larry Buell, who's protected a lot of his land. And before these land transfers from Larry Buell, the Nitmuk people retained four acres of their previous uh, land, which you can see the extent in this map, which covered you know, most of Connecticut, Rhode Island, and half of Massachusetts. So the Nipmuc are not the only tribal nation still present in Massachusetts. And in fact, in 2018, Mount Grace worked with four regional tribal nations uh, to create some cultural and natural history interpretive signage at our Alderbrook Meadows Sanctuary in Northfield. Uh, Northfield, of course, the Connecticut River was very important to the indigenous people. And you can uh, see the text of those signs and get some directions for visiting there at our website, mountgrace.org. That all brings us to the four lost towns. Imagine this letter, um, you know, dear town offices of Enfield, Greenwich, Dana and Prescott, by the terms of chapter 321, you're hereby no formally notified that the corporate existence of the aforesaid towns ceased as over. So here are the four said towns uh, shown on different maps. You can have Dana, Greenwich, Enfield, and Prescott. So Dana, I consider that closest to Lexington. And there it is uh, very close to Peter Sam, of course, this is all now either New Salem, mostly New Salem or Peter Sam, and of course, mostly either under the water or watershed land, but even land that's in the Quabbin Reservoir has to be part of a municipality, even if it's underwater. So most of the land is, in, is now in New Salem and, um, and, and Peter Sam, the, the, line, the town lines were redrawn. And so each of the four towns was quite distinctive. Um, it's very interesting that Prescott was here and it's, um, mostly intact, uh, but well, mostly, some of it's underwater, uh, but you can't go there because you, I, I didn't mention on that, um, there was a pink and blue map. This is uh, public access is, present, is prohibited on, on the peninsula. So each of the towns was unique. There was a total of 2,500 people in these four towns. And many of the residents, uh, well, 2,500 people were living and had to move and many of them moved nearby. And so Mount Grace uh, has helped more than 400 landowners conserve their land. And I've been involved with probably 300 projects in one, uh, 
one capacity or another. And we encounter many, many landowners who have family and maybe have relocated their homes um, outside of the Quabbin and are now in the, mostly on the periphery of the Quabbin. So it's kind of exciting. Um, in fact, our state representative, Susanna Whipp's family was uh, relocated from one of the towns. I, I don't know which one. Uh, there is a Swift River Historical Society, and you might not, if you're not familiar that the Swift River is in fact what was dammed to create the Quabbin Reservoir, you might not discover that, but the Swift River Historical Society really focuses on the four last towns and, and the people that, that used to live there. They have, uh, they're also a great online resource, and in uh, non-COVID times they do tours and you can visit the museum. Oh, I, I, so then, um, so Dano is the is the town that's closest to to Route Two, and there was a lot of manufacturing there. And in fact, Gate Forty will take you to some. You can get books and find information online about historic sites to visit. Um, Greenwich was more of an agricultural community, uh, heading down towards Hardwick, and includes um, Mount Lizzie, which is one of uh, one of the big landmarks in the Quabbin the oldest of the four towns and was established uh, with the name of Quabbin originally. Um, Enfield is where the, the lookout is. So that's a, a popular place to visit. That's in the Southern part of the Quabbin and there's the Enfield lookout. And it's also where they held the fi final ball. And Prescott, this sign, which I just think this is fascinating. This is what it's like in the North Quabbin or the Quabbin region. This is a sign that's standing now in Shutesbury, and it still gives you directions to Prescott. Uh, that's kind of interesting. And uh, I guess that's in the spirit of Daniel Shays. So the construction of the Quabbin, as I mentioned earlier, Boston is founded way over here in 1630. There's a lot of other reservoirs uh, that are being constructed and trying to manage the population and water supply for Boston. And, and then you get out here is when it's Quabbin started to materialize. Um, Wachusett was online at the turn of the last century. Then they say in, a 20, in 1915, there were rumors swirling. And in fact, the MDC, the Metropolitan Dis District Commission was formed. Then the Swift River Act was passed. It started clearing the valley. And then the towns were decommissioned. So this was a long process. Uh, the Swift River Act passed in 1927. The Quabbin was not full until 1946. So it was rather a long and agonizing process for the people who lived out here um, that could see the inevitable happening. You can imagine uh, your land, your business, your home, um, you know, farms that you developed, you knew that uh, eventually you have to sell and have to move. It was quite, uh, quite, quite a tragic era, and it did last a good 20 years. And it took seven years just for the water to fill. And it's very interesting that um, you can see uh, in the towns were commissioned in 38, uh, the clearing started in 36, and in fact, there were two, you know, two major hurricanes that happened all during that time. So in addition to, um, in addition to the 2,500 people that had to move, 7,500 people had to be exhumed uh, from at least cemeteries in at least seven towns. And many were relocated to this one cemetery that's the Quabbin Park Cemetery, which is right off of Route 9. Uh, but families could choose to have remains relocated to other cemeteries. So not all 7,500 people are here. And uh, I, in fact, I used to live across the street, directly across the street from the cemetery for four years uh, in the town of Ware. And it's open to the public. And, and every year they have a Memorial Day service, uh, which the public can attend. It was unfortunately canceled this year, um, but you can walk through here. It's, it's a lovely park. And uh, it's, this is where I started uh, running for exercise and uh, I could do, I can make a loop around the cemetery in five minutes and that's how much I ran. And then I worked up to 10 minutes, maybe that was two loops and then 15 minutes. And after that, I started running further and part of my run would include running across the dike um, and through the woods of the Quabbin Reservoir. Um, and so that was, uh, 
a really a, a fascinating and wonderful time of my life because learning to run and then being able to run, uh, I lived literally four doors, maybe, uh, you know, a quarter of a mile away from the gate to the Quabbin Park. And so, you know, many times a week, I would run through the Quabbin and unless it was a beautiful summer day, there were hardly ever any people there. It was um, quite typical to see more deer than people on any given day. And the water, seeing this big water and watching how the mood of the water changed with the weather was fascinating. And I moved away from here 20 years ago and it's uh, delightful for me to, to see these views which I used to be able to see on a daily basis. In fact, one day I would, you can ride your bike up the hill to or walk up to the tower. And I have gone up in the tower and seen uh, the sun setting and the moon rising uh, from the, the tower at the Quabbin Park. And it, it's quite, quite stunning. But as much as I miss that open water, I have to say that I actually prefer living in the more rural towns in the watershed area. And I believe that the greatest number of people uh, appreciate the accidental wilderness aspect of the Quabbin. It's true that cougars are known to pass through there. Um, and bobcat, which are probably very common even, or relatively common even in Lexington. This uh, photograph was taken in my yard last year. Uh, but eagles, bald eagles were reintroduced in the Quabbin in the 80s and they're very well established. This is a view of the, right here, a view of the, from the Enfield lookout. And you can go there on a winter's day and the, you might see a whole, um, a whole array of telescopes and they're looking either at uh, bald eagles in trees or sometimes car deer carcasses because deer will slip on the ice and then coyotes and um, the eagles will come and feed on the carcasses. And it's, it's something that you don't see every day. And so really there'll be a bank of telescopes and people are usually very generous and you can um, see the eagles and the wildlife from the Enfield lookout. Um, there are loon that nest at the Quabbin uh, and deer became so abundant that in the late 80s, there was, there was no hunting in the Quabbin from the, I think when it, from when it, its inception. And so they were eating all of the browse so there could be no regeneration of trees. And so they reopened the hunt. And it was one of, one of the many big controversies around the Quabbin. In fact, uh, there's a, a, a book I would recommend about that controversy and the name of that is Going Wild. Um, in fact, they do have an annual hunt, and I, I think that the, I don't know the details, but the deer and the trees are, uh, are coexisting, maybe more healthily. There was also a plan to reintroduce uh, rattlesnakes to the Quabbin, but uh, unlike the bald eagles, this, this uh, idea by Mass Fish and Wildlife was derailed uh, by a fishing group, so that never happened. That was another recent controversy. And here's a picture of one of the three Quabbin fishing gates. So I, I mentioned that the cultural significance of the Quabbin is just as important of today is as significant as the wildlife uh, significance. And so the watershed of the Quabbin Reservoir uh, in the, the North Quabbin is really a place that is quite special. And this gives you a little taste of it. Um, you can, there's a, a, a local historian, J.R. Green, I recommend looking up his books. I mean, he knows and has written volumes about the history of the towns that I've just mentioned in passing. And uh, he, you can find him um, through the Friends of Quabbin and also the Swift River Historical Society. Alan Young, a past Mount Grace board member and friend has written at least a half a dozen books about um, rural characters and the culture, the social life in the North Quabbin. This is a photograph of the historical museum, uh, which you can visit sometimes. And this is uh, one of our favorite maple sugar houses. Uh, the Johnson family had thousands of taps that they leased in the Quabbin Reservoir. And that's also a farm that Mount Grace helped conserve. We also, the North Quabbin, or actually the whole Quabbin, the Uniquely Quabbin is a relatively new magazine that is available. Um, I don't know if they have an online version. I don't know how you get it when you're in Lexington. I'm sorry, I didn't look into that, but I, I would, if I lived, if I was interested in the Quab and I would subscribe to it and it really focuses on arts and culture. And um, 
it's uh, it's it's just a, a great. Uh, and it, what I want to say about it is that I believe it uh, it occurs because uniquely Quaven it captures the fact that you know we're not that far away from cultural centers of Boston, Northampton, and even New York. Um, but it's very rural, and so there's a nice eclectic mix of arts, and a lot. You know, we have education and um, the rural lifestyle that's quite authentic here. Really, um, is appreciated, and so and there's a lot of talent here, and so we're able to keep up this this magazine about the area. You may have heard about the Quabbin, the North Quabbin Garlic and Arts Festival, and it was also. Uh, a Mount Grace land project at the Seeds of Solidarity Farm um, 20 years ago. Other farms in the area are captured in this beautiful book, which is available. So that's something about the cultural uh, resource that the North Quabbin and the Quabbin watershed is today. So more back to the, the natural history. Um, everything that's green here is forest. So you can see across the nation, Eastern forests are quite significant. And this is really about our, to me, about our forest, our land and uh, water conservation context. Um, land conservation in Massachusetts is essentially forest conservation. And even when we're doing farm conservation, uh, farms are mostly forest in acres, something you might not have known. Uh, ample rain is the reason we have forest. And ample rain and forest is the reason that Boston and Lexington have the Quabbin Reservoir. So Massachusetts is the third most densely populated state and the eighth most forested state. So the trees uh, and the watershed lands have a lot of competition um, from that density of people. It's important to remember in the time of climate change that you know, land and forest conservation is critical to carbon storage, carbon sequestration, and habitat resiliency in addition you know, to water supplies. Other places uh, in the country um, also benefit from forest. And I mentioned there are five unfiltered major metropolitan uh, water supplies. And so besides Boston, they're in San Francisco, Portland, Oregon, Seattle, and New York City. And these are all cities that with proximity to densely forested areas. So I liked um, Marilyn's comment earlier about um, the, the magnificence of the Quabbin because I have to tell you that when in 2006, um, I was quite surprised and proud to read about this uh, lecture that was gonna take place at Mount Holyoke where they were comparing the Quabbin Reservoir with Hetch Hetchy Canyon in Yosemite. And um, I think that it's very, it's very much too easy to take what's right in our backyard for granted. Um, myself, I did not consider the Quabbin um, on the same plane as Hetch Hetchy Canyon, uh, but I, I have to say that uh, there are some comparisons. And um, for example, Hetch Hetchy provides 80% of the water for two and a half million people in San Francisco, San Francisco area, so that's very similar to us. And in New York, the Catskill Mountains, um, they've done so much more with conservation. Of course, they have so many more people, but New York City has conserved 130,000 acres in its drinking water supply since 1997. Uh, I had that written in my notes and I had to go double check it because I just, I, I couldn't believe it. In Massachusetts, we have protected less than 30,000 acres since the 80s. And in New York, they've protected 130,000 acres since the 90s. Um, and in fact, the Catskills are twice as far away from New York as the Quabbin is from Boston. So this is a good company that we're in. It's quite prestigious and the Quabbin is really a special place. And while the Quabbin, um, we've done a lot to conserve the watershed in a hundred years, as I mentioned, the job is not finished yet. I'm gonna talk a little more specifically about conservation and try to wrap up in the next um, five minutes or so, so we can um, have some question and answers, but this is gonna bring us to the Quabbin to what choose it and land conservation uh, aspect. 
So um, Quaventa would choose it. Land Conservation Initiative is quite, uh, quite a, a seminal event and it didn't start uh, you know, all of a sudden out of nowhere. Um, I just, I wanted to give recognition to, this is Keith Ross who hired me to work at Mount Grace in the, in the uh, early, mid nineties. He's still, he lives in Warwick as I do. And this is our first uh, office. Now we're in a farmhouse. We were in a cottage in those days. And I learned a lot about conservation from, from Keith Ross. Then in my early days at Mount Grace, this is David Foster, uh, the former director of Harvard University that's based in Peter Sam. 1997, this uh, very important article was printed in the Journal of Conservation Biology, the history and importance of land use and land protection in the North Quabbin region. And in it, uh, David Foster said, he was speaking of that accidental green belt that I showed you that extends from the Quabbin. He said, uh, this is an accidental green belt imagine the significance of the conservation that could be achieved if there was coordination. And so um, I'll come back to how we decided to coordinate it. But before I do that, I wanna mention two other Quabbin conservation co colleagues. So Jim French is single-handedly, I mentioned 27,000 acres uh, since the eighties, Jim French, personally negotiated all of those 630 deals with landowners. So he's been the land acquisition specialist at um, MDC Water Supply uh, for 37 years. And in fact, he is on the board of a land trust, probably helped found the Sterling Land Trust. And it's no surprise that he's Mount Grace member number 43. So he's been involved with Mount Grace Land Conservation Trust much longer than I have. Um, also a land stewardship colleague, Bruce Spencer, Mount Grace, board, uh, Mount Grace member, uh, number 24, very early uh, lover and believer in land conservation, was the chief forester for 40 years at the Quabbin Reservoir. He has personally walked every acre of the Quabbin uh, multiple times in his career. And I interviewed both Jim and Bruce um, and visited with them in getting ready for this, for this slideshow. So when in 1997, when Harvard Forest called for more coordination in the North Quabbin, Mount Grace responded and we talked to our state agent, agency counterpart and there was a joint letter that was sent out to all of the multiple conservation entities, whether they were municipal uh, conservation commissions, statewide or local or regional land trusts, or individuals, anyone involved in land protection in the North Quabbin region was invited to participate in this new entity, the North Quabbin Regional Landscape Partnership. Mount Grace staffed it in a very uh, tangential way, very part-time. We meet, you know, over the 20 years that it's existed, we've met four, two to four times a year. Um, and since that started, there have been uh, regional conservation partnerships have flourished all over New England. Um, and I mention it because that, um, that experience of being a small organization in an area with a lot of conservation potential made it very clear to me that collaboration was a way to get more conservation done. And this chart um, shows some of what partnering can make happen because um, you know, all land trusts can do individual conservation projects one at a time. But in 2006, you can see on this, um, this timeline, in 2006, the first forest legacy multi-landowner conservation project was submitted and we can serve 2000 acres. And so this is important and I may, I may repeat myself, but um, the US Forest Service and the Forest Legacy Program, you know, if you're doing conservation, you're always looking for sources of funding for to conserve land and help landowners. And the US Forest Service, we're in a forested, heavily forested state, uh, Forest Legacy would fund basically one project per state. And so Mount Grace would search around for the biggest landowner we could find, maybe there'd be 500 acres, and we might get 
$400,000. Whereas Colorado might have a landowner with 10,000 acres and they might get $5 million. So we thought that wasn't fair. And so we put 20 landowners together to equal 2,000 acres and got a $3 million grant. And we liked that much better. And the reason the Forest Service allowed us to do that is because we had the track record in a special initiative of protecting a lot of land in a short period of time. And so that set the stage for more multi-landowner forest legacy projects. Not all of them are in the Quabbin. So I've just highlighted in green the multi-landowner projects in the Quabbin watershed. Um, I can say, I'll say a little bit more about it, but you can see that there's state funded landscape scale projects because about nearly 10 years ago, the state created a grant program for landscape partnership um, projects where the minimum requirement is 500 contiguous acres and two partners working together because they see the effectiveness of partnerships and multi-landowner land conservation. So I'm gonna show you a map, um, but first I wanna tell you what's gonna be on the map. You can see that we combined a, for, a forest legacy program application of 32 landowners with a state landscape partnership program with seven landowners. And that is what the Quabbin to Wet Use it initiative is. And I'm, I'm sorry, this isn't a sharper map, but this amazing map, all of the parcels that show here total about over 4,000 acres and they are two different um, funding applications. So what's blue, what's green is already protected land. What's blue is the Quabbin watershed, uh, which is the point of our talk. And what's yellow was in the state application and the parcels in red were in the federal application. And of course, and what's amazing that all of these parcels are contiguous, not always to each other, but contiguous through other protected land. So you could walk from one parcel to another across this whole expanse, which is about nine miles uh, without leaving conservation land. And of course, building large blocks and corridors is really the most ecologically significant way to protect land, which is one of the things that we learned um, well in conservation biology and was pointed out in that paper by David Foster. So it, <laughs> protecting all that land took, uh, it's also a multi-year project, multi-landowner and multi-project. It wasn't easy, but um, none of us could have done it alone. We had a lot of partners Every funding source has its own rules and um, that's true with Forest Legacy. And so it's, it's imperative that we work with towns and state agencies to make these conservation deals happen. And I'm proud to say that Mount Grace um, took the lead in, in writing the application and has you know, done a dozen of these multi-landowner uh, projects. I'll just point out one of the, this is a largest, this is an anchor project. You can see how it fills in, this is um, five, almost 600 acres, fills in a large gap. But I think what's important about projects like this when you're doing a multi-landowner uh, project is that the large anchor projects makes it possible to protect some of these smaller parcels that on their own could not attract funding. But when they're aggregated together in a multi-landowner project that has more ecological significance, projects like this can really go far to assisting other landowners. So that's really the end of my uh, talk. This, the rest of it is an invitation. So this slide is an invitation and I'll get back. This is uh, what I mentioned is this pink area, Prescott uh, Peninsula is where there's no public access in the islands. Unfortunately, you can't have, there's no public access on the islands. You can boat around the islands, but you can't go on the islands. So that I just wanted meant to point that out. So when you're coming out to visit, you wanna get a copy of this map. And then you wanna visit the Harvard Forest Museum, which is off of Route 32. And they have a wonderful museum with exquisite dioramas that are even, um, there's a book of the dioramas of the, the history of the forest. This is the Peter Sam Country Store. Um, these poor souls might be bicycling around the Quabbin, but um, they might be in better shape than me. This is Rose 32 Bakery. I have to give a shout out to them. They're down here, my favorite bakery. This is the Quabbin Visitor Center at, and it's located right next to the dam. 
This is the Enfield Lookout, the tower again. This is the lookout in New Salem. If you don't, uh, if you want to stay in the north on Route 2, you can, this is a view of the Quabbin from New Salem. While you're in New Salem, stop at uh, New Salem Preserves for some hard cider. And so you're probably still serving outside. Um, Soup on the Fly has been replaced with a new restaurant since I put these slides together. Quabbin Harvest is a food co-op located in Orange. And Mount Grace owns a building and we, um, we bought a building in order to lease to the co-op because they serve the, the Quabbin area farms. And of course, if you're gonna need some outdoor gear, stop at Trailhead uh, on your trip. So that's my uh, little self-guided tour. And now I want to uh, play a video. Uh, but before I do, let me say, oh, maybe I'm not going to, I'll just play it. I believe it's important to give to Mount Grace because it's an investment, not only for myself, but for people all over the state of Massachusetts. There are a lot of ways you can help Mount Grace. Become a member, join the Margaret Power Big Society, and sit down with me to explore traditional and creative giving options. So as I mentioned, um, the job of protecting the water supply for half of Massachusetts is not finished yet. Um, there's more than 1 million priority acres still in need of protection, including this gorgeous uh, property here overlooking the Quabbin Reservoir. This is the New Salem Preserves property. Um, the same rainfall that waters the apple trees and fields and flower gardens and woods of Carol Hillman's New Salem Preserves runs from your faucets, fills your glass, and is in your morning coffee and your Sam Adams lager. Uh, your support can go a long way in nearby central mass to protect more of this precious watershed and countryside. Like Bill Foy, uh, you can make a lasting impact. So I wanna invite you to become a Mount Grace member, to consider buying land as a conservation investor. Uh, even reading more about the Quabbin history and significance will indirectly contribute to the further protection of this land. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. So we do have some time for questions. Um, did you want to stop the screen share, Lee, and I'll come up on screen mm -hmm. with you. Um, so we do have a few questions in chat. Um, and if anybody does have any questions, you are welcome to um, put them into chat and I will ask them of Lee. If we run out of time, uh, she did say that she would answer these questions separately. Um, so if you put your question in chat and we don't get to it today, um, we can answer it and send it to you by email later. Uh, so the first question that we have in here is, what happened to all the timber when the trees were cleared from the four towns? That's a very good question. Um, I don't know the answer to it. <laughs> Maybe someone can Google it while we're talking. Okay. Uh, I'm not one of those people that can Google and talk at the same time. Fair enough. Um, somebody else asked, they're curious about the eagle population at the Quabbin and the best place to see them. And you mentioned something um, about uh, bringing the eagles back in. You talked about bringing rattlesnakes in. Um, can you talk broadly about the eagle population in general at, in Quabbin? And if you know more about the state, um, you know, throughout the state, that's helpful too. Well, I am more familiar with that than I am uh, with uh, timber, the trees that came down. But um, yeah, I, I don't have the latest statistics, but it's in the vicinity of there are at least, uh, there are approximately 40, um, 40 nesting pairs of bald eagles in Massachusetts. Maybe, you know, roughly half of them, maybe some percentage are at Quabbin, but they've, since they were reintroduced at the Quabbin when they were only present at the Quabbin, they've now become 
common across Massachusetts, really wherever there's a river, um, mostly rivers, some lakes, um, you'll find eagles nesting. And so I'd be interested, you know, um, out here, you know, on the Connecticut River, they're very common. Mount Grace actually has a property called Eagle Reserve in Royalston. It's on the eastern end of our uh, region in uh, Winchenden, and well, it's on the Winchenden Royals, uh, Royalston line called Eagle Reserve, and there's nesting bald eagles there on a big uh, swamp. And so I think that it's fair to say that the eagle population is quite strong in Massachusetts. I have definitely noticed that in the past few years, I hear people talking about seeing eagles in places where you had not seen them before and maybe don't even expect them. So, um, but I think people are appreciative of that. I'll just say when when I was growing up in Springfield as a kid, I always thought I would have to go to Alaska to see a bald eagle. And uh, you know, I've I've seen them many many times. It's always a thrill when I do see them. But um, yeah, that's a surprise to me too. It, and it, it's a positive one. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Can you talk about the total costs involved in land acquisition, ongoing support, maintenance, et cetera, all of the, um, all of the pieces of the work that you do? At Mount Grace? Yes. Oh, sure. So Mount Grace's budget, uh, annual budget, not including land projects, is uh, just under a million dollars a year. So it's a, I think it's about it's eight or nine hundred thousand dollars to staff the organization to take care of the, our, our property and steward the lands that we own. So of the 35,000 acres that we've conserved, we own about just under 2,000 that we own and manage and about 10,000 acres of conservation easements that we take care of. And so the money for all of that uh, comes mostly from individual donations that's supplemented by grants. And then of course we have, we have some timber income, we have some interest income, and then we do have some planning service fees that we sometimes charge um, our partners. Um, and then for the land protection aspect, which they might've been asking, um, as in the budget that I showed with the multi-landowner projects, typically in our region, we're very fortunate because of that accidental green belt of protected land that we're, frequently able to partner with a state agency where a portion of the cost of land conservation is paid by a state agency. And then some, the balance is through fundraising from donations and grants. And of course, people make, um, you know, do bargain sales or do donations of easements or land. But in our part of the state, which is uh, Franklin County, I think has the lowest, you know, economic indicators in Massachusetts, often landowners, they need to be paid for conservation. So we're very fortunate that we have high quality lands so that um, those grant applications are competitive and landowners you know, have high quality resources. They can get paid for conservation often from public sources. Mm -hmm. um, what do you hope you and Mount Grace can achieve in the near future? And I, I don't know if this is a broad question or if you have specific goals in the next five years. So you can answer it whichever angle you'd sure. like to take. <laughs> yeah, well, a couple of the things that are happening now, and you know, these are things that have been going on say for five years or more, is that more of an emphasis, it's, it's still land conservation and land stewardship, but with an emphasis on climate resiliency and also um, equity, social equity, racial equity. So on the climate side, um, you know, in the last, five or six years, Mount Grace, you know, we've been very active in um, new mapping techniques that have been uh, developed by say the Nature Conservancy together with state agencies so that we know the most, the, the acres and then the geography where land is most resilient to climate change. And what that generally means is that uh, the Nature Conservancy has identified a way to, I, to um, indicate what lands are most uh, biodiverse now and because of their topographic characteristics are most likely to be biodiverse in the future, even though the specific composition of, of plants, the natural community will be different, is still likely to be most biodiverse. So we are trying to be um, you know, more intentional about protecting those 
higher, those lands with more resiliency. Um, one of the other things that we want to do is um, we are exploring participating in carbon offsets of our protected land so that we can use income from sequestering carbon to fund more land conservation. So that's not something that we've done in the past and we're looking into doing that right now. That's something that we're actively exploring. And so we hope that that will help um, in a lot of ways because Mount Grace, I mentioned we have 2000 acres and we do actively manage some of our forest land, not all of it for forest products. And so we want to be demonstrating uh, inform, climate informed forestry. And so by participating in carbon offsets and you know, having intentionally designed forest management plans that are uh, attuned and uh, factoring in climate change, we can help educate the public that it's not an either or, it's not climate change or forestry or carbon sequestration or forestry, it's not one or the other. And then on uh, equity and diversity, we're doing more to recruit a more diverse um, board and staff. We're also doing more um, as far as education, you know, doing learning more as individuals and as staff and the board about historic uh, land loss and historic, um, you know, systemic racism that leads that there's a lot of information. It's, it's amazing. I think the statistic is 90 8% of farmland in America is owned by white people. And as recently as 1920, it was about 85%. I think, I think that's the number. But so in you know, our lifetime, the statistics are getting worse. And it's not something that we've put a lot of attention to in the past, but it's something that we want to be more, um, you know, more deliberate about going forward. So one of, one of our, and it might help that, um, for many years, 10 years, we've worked with affordable farmland conservation. And so we right now have uh, four affordable farms, affordable whole farms. And so it could be possible that um, one of the answers to having more diverse landowners in the region might be through our affordable farm program. Something to keep an eye on, that's kind of interesting. Um, two more questions, and it looks like we'll wrap up exactly on time. Uh, the next one is hopefully a quick and easy. What is the full name of the map that you showed of the Quabbin, and who publishes it? <laughs> yeah, I put that in the resources. I can tell you if I, I hope okay. I'm getting it right. Yes, here it is. It's the, the Quabbin Reservation Guide, and it's actually available from Eastern Mountain Sports. So if you just Google Quabbin Reservation Guide EMS, you can get it for six ninety five. dollars Perfect. That's fantastic. <laughs> I love maps. Um, so our last question is actually, it's a comment, but it leads into a question that I want to ask that I think is a nice way to wrap up. The comment is that Eagle Reserve is a beautiful and accessible property. Somebody has hiked there several times this year already. So I'm... Um, you had mentioned that people, there's a lot of opportunities for recreation um, within the, the area. So can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, more about the, the hiking trails and you said that boating is allowed. What, what are some of the ways that you can invite people to enjoy the outdoor space over there? Yeah, um, well, let's see. Um, I mean, I can invite you to go and bring your boat to the Quabbin Reservoir, but you have to, you know, check with them about the rules. Um, Mount Grace, we do have on our, I can talk about our website, and of course, you know, uh, so I will say that on our website, you can visit the lands that we own and their directions for getting there. Um, and in fact, Eagle Reserve, I'll just say a little bit about that, and then I'll talk more broadly, is Eagle Reserve just like Alderbrook Meadows that was mentioned, they both have accessible trails. So for folks that don't wanna be on a rugged trail system or maybe they're in a wheelchair, maybe they're small children, these are each half mile trails that are close to the road. They're both on our website. You could go, for example, to mountgrace.org and type in accessible trail or trail uh, and you, you get this information with directions. And so we're very happy that in the last four or five years, we've built these accessible trails one in the eastern part of our region and one in the western part. It's quite remarkable to me that um, 
you know, we've protected 35,000 acres and on this one five acre Alderbrook meadow, you know, it's just such a culturally rich and important area because it has a unique public access opportunity. So, um, so there are so many opportunities, you know, um, we, we have quite a few trails. The state forests and parks have, um, you know, on their website, they have information about the state parks where you can hike. And, you know, that pink and blue Quabbin Reservation Guide uh, shows you where the, the gates are for hiking in the Quabbin. I think that's a good start. Um, yeah, there's, I think coming out here and exploring is, uh, the Tully Lake is another place, you know, there, there's camping there, there's a Tully Trail, and that's very close to us. So that's, I think that'll get people started. <laughs> And is all of it or a lot of it still accessible in the colder months? Well, if you have snowshoes and okay. you bring a shovel so you can get out of the parking lot, um, you know, that is a question. I mean, we have less and less snow, but, you know, Mount Grace, for example, we don't uh, maintain parking areas, okay. but, you know, some of these conservation areas do. Uh, it'll be interesting to see because, of course, with COVID, so many more people are getting outdoors and, mm -hmm. Um, you know, at these Quabbin gates, there's a lot more cars than there used to be. So it'll be very interesting to me to see if anybody bothers to plow their parking areas because people do want to continually get outside. And of, of course we do, uh, uh, and we will continue to plow the parking lot here at Skyfields Arboretum. So everyone is welcome to come here and hike the trails at Skyfields Arboretum. That's good to know because I have done some winter hiking and a lot of the, the parking spaces don't get cleared. So. <laughs> That was my incentive for asking. Right, so there's one. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> That's all we need. <laughs> um, well, on behalf of the library, I would like to thank you very much for coming today. I would like to thank everyone who attended and listened to this talk. Um, I hope that you all enjoyed it. I'm going to invite Marilyn to come back on screen. Um, I'm asking you if you'll unmute yourself and I'm gonna bring you back onto the screen. Um, so thank you, Marilyn, for letting me be part of this. Thank you, Lee, for coming and, and doing this talk and being so flexible and rescheduling it to, you know, accommodate our new lifestyle. Um, and on behalf of the library, thank you to everyone who's attended. Hi, and I would like to thank everybody from the Lexington Field and Garden Club that attended the talk and everyone that uh, um, could get online to the Zoom and listen to this wonderful presentation. And um, I invite you to check the Lexington Field and Garden Club website and also um, news about us in the local papers because we do have talks once a month open to the public, but you have to because of Zoom, um, sign, up, sign in. So you have to contact the Lexington Field and Garden Club if you want to um, see any of our wonderful programs. And thank you, Lee, for such a wonderful talk and um, good luck with uh, all your future endeavors. Thank you. And I also want to th thank everyone for tuning in and for the in invitation. Um, there's an opportunity next Thursday. If you want to Zoom some more, Mount Grace is having its first virtual annual meeting on Thursday. Uh, it's in the evening. And I don't think you have to register, but you can find the information about our annual meeting uh, at mountgrace.org, spelled out, you know, M-O-U-N-T-G-R-A-C-E.org. And it's going to include a hike and some, um, some, some fun things. So, uh, please stay in touch and get outside and thank you for caring about the planet. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you. It was a great presentation. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye now.